program, a production of the Food and Drug Administration, in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, is presented by the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. A biological release is a public health emergency, and it's got to be viewed that way. It is not a hazmat incident. It can happen on the battlefield. It can happen in our cities. It can happen anywhere. How should we prepare? Will we recognize the signs? Do we have the right tools? the right training. The most important thing we can do today is assist local and state public health agencies with doing the kind of planning to say in our community what will it take to identify a potential bioterrorism event. And it will vary from community to community. There is no magic formula which will say this is what you need to do. Will we be ready? We have to be worried about the future. Maybe not today, maybe five years from now, maybe ten years from now. I believe it, it will be easily possible for a proliferator from any place in this world to produce an agent that might be different than what we might expect. It might uh, produce a disease syndrome that is different than it, it did before. It might be more difficult for us to detect on the battlefield. It might be more difficult for us to treat. Hello everyone and welcome to the first day of the Medical Response to Biological Warfare and Terrorism Satellite Course. I'm Doris McMillan and with me you'll be glad to see the return of Lieutenant Colonel C. Slack as my co-host. Howdy. <laughs> Now, before we get started with some housekeeping details, we'd like to introduce some very special guests who've joined our studio audience today. Dr. Sue Bailey, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, and with her is Major General John Parker, Commander of the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command. General Parker has provided crucial support to education in biological and chemical medical defenses. Welcome. Thank you very much, Doris, and thank you so much for being again, here with us this year again. It's a pleasure to be here. The United States Army has been doing research and teaching in the chemical and biological area for over 60 years. I am very proud of those scientists, engineers, and teachers. The scientific basis for the material that you're going to hear about today has its roots in the research that those people performed. I'm honored that Dr. Sue Bailey, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, will open our distance learning session today. I want you to know that Dr. Bailey is a staunch advocate of national preparedness, both civil and military. She has made sure that the national command authorities are aware of the threat and of the capabilities of our response. Dr. Bailey, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, General Parker. Good afternoon. I am delighted to kick off this live satellite broadcast. The threat of warfare and of terrorism using weapons of mass destruction has heightened over the past few years. There are nation states and terrorist groups that have both the political will and the technical capability to use chemical and biological agents as instruments of terror as well as instruments of warfare. In the area of prevention, the Department of Defense recently reached a landmark decision in our immunization policy against biological warfare agents. Earlier this year, the Secretary of Defense announced the beginning of a total force anthrax immunization program. This is an efficient, effective, and safe way to protect our forces against a lethal biological warfare threat. On a separate but equally important front, bioterrorism against the U.S. citizens is more likely today than ever before. As a nation, we have only recently established strong policy platforms to prevent and to counter bioterrorism. 
This is a troublesome task because detection and interdiction of bioterrorism is very difficult. In bioterrorism, the likely first responders will be healthcare providers in hospital emergency rooms. Providers and notable specialists in infectious diseases will constitute the front line of defense. The swiftness with which our healthcare providers reach an accurate diagnosis and the urgency with which they apply preventative and therapeutic measures will determine the difference between hundreds versus thousands of casualties. Today, many healthcare providers have not seen a case of anthrax, smallpox, or plague, or would recall the clinical features of those cases. We should pause for a moment and ask ourselves the question, what would happen if a biological agent were released today in a major U.S. city? Unlike Tokyo, where the effect of the nerve agent sarin caused an immediate medical response, a small amount of anthrax, plague, or smallpox released in a subway or air terminal would surely go unnoticed until the first symptomatic complaints occurred some days later. With patients seen by different health care providers in different hospitals, several days would pass before it would be confirmed that a bioterrorism event had occurred. The initial numbers requiring hospitalization would be only the tip of the iceberg. Morbidity would extend to a population of patients many times larger as they manifest symptoms and receive an uncertain diagnosis. This population of symptomatic and presumably undiagnosed cases would spread to other cities and states. Could your hospital admit 100 patients with a communicable disease requiring isolation? Could your hospital care for these patients, remembering that few hospital staff have immunity to plague or smallpox? With a highly communicable disease, such as smallpox or pneumonic plague, hundreds or thousands of cases could quickly overwhelm our public health infrastructure. What methods of control will you use to apply to those thousands infected as well as those at risk? What medical support, isolation, immunization, medication? Do you have a sufficient supply of vaccine, antibiotics, or antivirals to proceed with immunization or treatment? Should vaccine be limited only to close contacts of confirmed cases? Are you prepared to work not only on the initial wave of casualties, but on day after day of additional cases as they present to your hospital? Are you prepared to conduct an investigation of an intentional disease outbreak? Do we have the necessary capacity for surveillance? These are, of course, rhetorical questions. Over the next few days, however, you and thousands of your colleagues will learn the answers and we as a nation will have taken a giant step towards preparing ourselves to deal with one of the most challenging problems we face today. In closing, I would like to thank the Department of Health and Human Services, and especially General Parker, for his leadership and support in making today's course possible. Lastly, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us over the next few days for this program. Through this course, you will become an invaluable resource to the defense of our nation. For this, I sincerely thank you. Now back to you, Doris. Thank you, Dr. Bailey, and thank you, General Parker, for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. And now I'd like to reintroduce my co-host and head instructor, who many of you will remember fondly from last year, Dr. Ted Cislak, from the Operational Medicine Division of USAMRU. Well, I don't know if fondly is the right, Doris, oh. uh, right word, Doris, but uh, thanks. Good to be I here. I think it fits perfectly. We'll both be your hosts for the next three days of this course, and Ted will do double duty as head instructor as well. Now, this is the second time that USAMRU, the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, has presented this information with co-sponsorship from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Public Health Training Network, Network, and the Food and Drug Administration via live video teleconference. Last year's program, Medical Management of Biological Casualties, was a big success, and we hope to continue the tradition with the help of all of you in the audience. We'll review some of the material we discussed last year, and we've also added some new information to keep you up to date. We've even updated our Bio Casualty Handbook. The new third edition should be uh, in your participant packet.
And we'll discuss the contents of those packages in a moment, but first a few words on how the course will be conducted. We want you to have the chance to interact with all of our live instructors, and we will offer that to you via phone lines and faxes. Throughout the program, two phone numbers will appear on your screen. One is the live call-in number, which is 1-800-527-1401, and the other is our fax number. It's 1-888-888. 361-4011. Outside the continental United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, you will need to use 301-827-3639 for call-in questions and 301-827-3262 for faxes. And you can fax in any time during the program, but we have scheduled call-in segments, so we'll let you know when the lines will be open for your phone questions. Now, all of you should have received your participant packets by now. These packets include a variety of references that should prove useful, and a student booklet that contains the scenarios and questions that we'll be covering throughout the program. Now, you should have two of these in each packet. One is broken down for the live broadcast in September, and one for the rebroadcast in October. Uh, the first page of the booklet will tell you which one is for which broadcast. They have the same information in them, so if someone in your classroom didn't get a participant packet, you can give one of them away. Now, due to many last-minute registrations, some of you may not have received a packet. You can share the print material, but it is essential that all of you use original scan forms when it comes time to take the final exam and evaluation. If anyone at the downlink site still needs a scan form, ask your site facilitator to send a fax to area code 404 839-0800 by the end of the broadcast today, stating how many sets of forms you need. Uh, we'll also need your address and phone number. Now, if you are at a site that has not received any participant packets, also write on the fax that you need a copy of the final exam and evaluation. The exams can be reproduced locally, and we will FedEx these to you in time for the final exam. Uh, the number also uh, for the scan form is area code 404 639 0800. Keep in mind that uh, if you do FedEx uh, your form, do not use a post office box address. FedEx will only deliver to a street address and they have to have a phone number. You should receive them by Thursday at the latest. And now about our program. You'll be surprised to discover we have a few things to offer over the next few days that just aren't found in your traditional classroom setting. Besides having several medical experts in the field of biological warfare and terrorism uh, who will be appearing live here over the next three days, we also have pre-taped interviews with a variety of experts who couldn't be here in the studio with us. We have several compelling video scenarios and daily diagnostic exercises for you to complete at your downlink sites. We will have two of those each day. They've got their work cut out for them, don't That's they, right. Ted? That's right. And we've also got... Uh, continuing education credits for you, and I wonder if you could uh, enlighten them as to this. Sure. Uh, the nurses who attend all three days of the broadcast and complete the final exam and evaluation will receive 14.4 continuing nursing education units. Now, all the physicians who do so will receive 12 continuing medical education units, and everyone else will receive 1.2 continuing education units. And don't worry uh, too much about the final exam. It will be open book, and as long as you're paying attention, should be no problem. Uh, we'll give you far more details about that that on the third and final day of the program. Well, now I think it's time to introduce our next guest, Colonel Jerry Parker, commander of USAMRID. Colonel Parker has extensive experience with medical biological defense, having served as the chief of toxinology division, uh, deputy commander, and now commander of USAMRID. With Colonel Parker today, we are also very privileged to have with us Mr. Bob Blitzer, head of domestic terrorism for the FBI. Mr. Blitzer is the section chief of the FBI's domestic terrorism, counterterrorism planning section, and he has an extensive background in international and domestic terrorism. Welcome, gentlemen, and thanks for joining us. And tell us, why is there so much concern today about biological warfare and terrorism? Colonel Parker. Well, Doris, the threat to biological warfare has increased, but, but just as importantly, our appreciation and understanding of our vulnerabilities has become sharpened. When the Biological Weapons Convention was signed in 1972, it was thought that we only had a few countries out there that were developing a BW capability. Well, the Gulf War was a wake-up call for us, and we learned a great deal about who and how biological weapons might be employed against us or against our allies. And our, and our concept for use and our defense doctrine was, was based upon a battlefield uh, scenario and a battlefield threat. We know, now know that there's many more countries working on biological capability, and we know that several of those countries are also supporters of international terror, terrorism. So the, the BW threat is serious, and the battlefield 
may indeed be right on our own soil in the form of bioterrorism. All right. Mr. Blitzer, how does the FBI view the threat? Well, just echoing what Jerry mentioned, uh, for us, we've seen a change in climate over about the last 10 years. Just look at the kind of cases we've seen. Pan Am 103, World Trade Center, Cobar Towers, and, and the bombings uh, recently in Africa. This is different. This is uh, large uh, casualties, and, and it's of great concern. And let's face it, uh, with the, uh, the taboo being broken in Japan by the Aum Shinrikyo, uh, it's happened. It's actually happened. Now, that was, that was come, but uh, it's not far away. You know, Doris, I think for the people out there in the studio, uh, it's useful for me uh, to think of this threat on three levels. So I like to think of the bio uh, threat on a strategic level, a tactical level, and a terrorist level. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the strategic level, here I mean what would the enemy, and let's pick on the Soviet Union since they're not around anymore, what would the Soviet four-star general think makes a good weapon? His job is to win the war, to alter the course of global politics. And what would help him do that? Well, if you look at it that way, the news is actually pretty good because there are very few weapon systems that have the downwind drift and the widespread uh, applicability to make them viable strategic weapons. And I think Dr. Bailey mentioned all of those. Uh, there's smallpox, there's plague, uh, there's anthrax, but very little else would make a viable strategic weapon. And we're not there yet, but it's entirely possible that with a little bit of research, we might come up with effective medical countermeasures for everything on that very short list. Now, when you switch gears and you talk about tactical weapons, what do I mean here? Well, here I mean, what would the Soviet lieutenant colonel think makes a good weapon? His job is to take that hill this week. What would help him do that? Well, again, the news here is still pretty good. Now the list gets a little bit longer. Some of the toxins might now be included. But still, there are only seven or eight agents that would be viable tactical weapons. And again, with some work, we might come up with effective medical countermeasures for everything on that very short list. I'm here to tell you, though, and I'm sure Mr. Blitzer would agree with me, that when you start talking about terrorism, the task gets much, much tougher uh, because literally anything might make a good terrorist weapon. I think you have to ask yourself, what's the average terrorist after? And often the answer to that question is publicity. And if that's all I'm after, virtually anything uh, will get me what I want. And, and for a great example of that, uh, let's look at the Benai Brith incident. And for those of you who don't remember this, uh, in April of 1997, a postal worker uh, at the Benai Brith headquarters in downtown Washington, D.C., uh, came upon a package in the mail room. And this package was dripping red liquid, and he opened the package, and inside was a, a blood auger plate, a Petri dish, uh, and written on there was the word anthrax, misspelled, but anthrax <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, and he did exactly what he was supposed to do. He pushed the correct panic buttons. He called uh, the FBI. Uh, they came down, retrieved the sample, uh, and tested it for the presence of anthrax. Well, uh, in the midst of all this, many other agencies got involved. Basically, a decon station got set up on Massachusetts Avenue. They quarantined the building. Uh, they took 100 people inside that building, stripped them down to their underwear, paraded them through decon in full view of the CNN cameras. And, um, I have very mixed feelings for how things went that day. Uh, on the one hand, I think it was overkill. Um, I think that you could have tested that. Uh, again, biological weapons have something that other weapons don't have. They have incubation periods. In the case of anthrax, that incubation period would have been at least 24 hours. You would have had 24 hours to figure out what was going on. Well, as it turns out, um, there was nothing on that plate. There were no pathogens at all. And yet, here's a terrorist who got everything he ever could have hoped for. He shut down the nation's capital of the United States of America at rush hour on a Friday with an empty dish. And if he could do that with nothing, imagine what you could do with anything. And, and, and that's, sure that's really an important example, I think, Ted, because and our, here, here was the first, I think, major test of the first response to something like this in the United States, and it was somewhat confused, to say the least. But from that, I think we learned some lessons. These hoaxes can be very serious for us, and, and we spend an awful lot of time on them. And unfortunately, we're getting more and more hoaxes every year, and it's resource intensive for law enforcement and the fire community. And uh, uh, we have to treat every single one of them as if it's the real thing, because you know, God knows when it will be the real thing. Hmm. Colonel Parker, is this increasing the concern that a serious biological incident could occur? Well, the simple answer to that is, is yes, but let me explain a little bit. There's a growing concern that there's going to be uh, increased proliferation of, of weapons of mass destruction uh, to include biological pathogens and associated uh, delivery technology uh, to disperse uh, biological agents. As an example, 
the former Soviet Union had a, had a large uh, offensive biological program. Today, there's thousands uh, of scientists, engineers, and technicians who are either out of work or have not been paid for a long time. They have families to feed, and they simply could be tempted uh, to sell their knowledge and expertise to, to the highest bidder, whoever that may be. Uh, when you couple that with the fact that there seems to be a, an increasing trend amongst terrorists to uh, inflict uh, uh, indiscriminate killing on a larger scale, well then, yes, uh, we just simply have higher odds that a serious biological attack could occur and could come from either a regional aggressor, uh, a rogue third world nation, terrorist group, or even a religious cult. Mm. Is this an, um, I'm, I'm sorry, do you think that a terrorist would use a biological agent the answer is, Mr. yeah, I do think they would. It, it's a simple answer, but let's face it, uh, just looking around at the kinds of cases we've had, uh, uh, the, the, the trend is mass, cas mass casualties, as Jerry mentioned. And uh, what better uh, way to do it, frankly, and uh, uh, particularly in a bio, which is so insidious, because by the time they do it, they're gone, and you have an incubation period. And by the time you actually know it's happened, it's too late. That's right. I think if you asked me, uh, you know, what's the chance that somebody in Ottumwa, Iowa, will successfully use anthrax as a weapon this year, I'd say the chances of that are pretty slim. But if you ask me, what are the chances that somebody, somewhere, will use something uh, in the next decade, I think the chances are almost 100%. And I think uh, Colonel Parker and Mr. Bush would probably agree with me. I agree. Well, Mr. Buzzer, what's the FBI been saying lately? Well, we've seen a, a tremendous upsurge in the number of cases around the nation, and it's really of concern to me because we, we began a couple of years ago with maybe 20, 30 cases a year, and now we're seeing an excess of 100 cases a year, and, and I think that's significant because uh, we are actually arresting and convicting people. Now, granted, these are basically lone actors, but it's out there, and uh, I've not seen it before. And in the whole scheme of things, I think it's an important trend, and we're following it very closely. Right. I think a great example of this trend is the case of uh, Mr. Larry Wayne Harris, and I'm sure many of the audience members are probably familiar uh, with Mr. Harris's case. You'll remember that he was the gentleman uh, arrested earlier in 1998 uh, with uh, anthrax in his trunk, and as it turns out, it was a, a veterinary vaccine strain, a harmless strain, but certainly uh, it instituted a Chinese fire drill, consumed a lot of the FBI's mm -hmm. resources, et cetera, et cetera. You'll also remember he was the same gentleman who in 1995 was arrested with plague in his glove compartment. And again, and just a lone actor like this can certainly consume a lot of government resources. And, and you know, the thing about that case was that, it, <clears throat> that as we tested it, we kept getting hits for live uh, anthrax. So it wasn't until the definitive tests were done some 30, 40 hours after the event that we actually knew we had a vaccine. How's the Internet uh, interacting in this? Yeah, I mean, it's out there. Yeah. I mean, it's all out there. If you, uh, if you look around the Internet, not only do you see uh, stuff for bio, you see it for chem, arsons. It's, it's just a, a panoply of information on the Internet that just makes things really easy for people. All right. Uh, Colonel Parker, why is it so difficult to control biological weapons proliferation? I mean, can't we just use treaties and agreements like we've done for nuclear and chemical weapons? Well, I wish we could, but it's not that simple. Uh, biological treaties have, have proven to be just very, very difficult to en enforce. In fact, most of the, treaty, the treaties have not had just the enforcement teeth. But it really comes down to uh, uh, biological pathogens can be produced very easily, and the same equipment that's, uh, need, uh, that's needed to produce a biological pathogen for nefarious use Use, has legitimate research, medical, and other applications. So that dual-use nature makes it very uh, difficult to gauge uh, the intent uh, of the bad guys, so to speak. And so it's that dual-use uh, equipment that that's very, makes it very easy to hide illicit activities. And that can go on even on a national scale, as we now know Iraq, the former Soviet Union, had very large uh, offensive biological capabilities, and it goes simply undetected. Mm. It's, you know, a great example of this phenomenon uh, concerns this explosion of microbreweries that's occurring in the United States. And Russian inspectors uh, come to our country for various reasons, and they're very concerned uh, about this explosion of microbreweries because each and every one of these breweries could, with very little